I'm just so delighted to be here and um, of course would like to start um, by thanking Her Excellency and the UAE government for the invitation. Um, I've just been told that uh, my talk has been reduced by three minutes to try and help us keep to time. Um, but I've also just made an executive decision that I'm going to also eat into a little bit of my time because we've all been sitting still for a long time today and so I'm going to start with a little exercise and I'm going to ask everyone to stand up please and turn and face a partner. We're going to run a quick brain break which is a um, positive education activity. So what I will need is for everyone just to be quiet for a moment so you can hear the instructions. Thank you. So if you could please turn to your partner and point your index finger towards each other to the point where they're almost touching but they're not quite touching. Now, I would like within your partnership for you to nominate one person who is the leader. <laughs> and then, what I would like you to do is for the leader to write out the word happy and for the follower to be so mindfully present that your finger exactly follows the movements of the leader. When you've finished, give yourself a high five and sit down. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. So I can, I can feel a little bit more energy in the room as a result of that. Um, before I launch into my scientific findings, I, I, I'd just love to know the answer. I have a question for you, and if you could just raise your hands if you have children at school or have had children at school. Raise your hands nice and high. Great, so I can see that this, this talk will be of interest to um, the, the majority of the people here. The title of my talk was actually provided to me by um, the conference organisers. I love the title of this talk. School kids been, can be happier and we can prove it. I think it's a it's an engaging title, it's a hopeful title, it's a thought-provoking title, it's, it's, a, it's a direct and simple title. Um, it's pretty much the opposite of everything I would have written if I was asked to write the title. <laughs> because as an academic, I would have used, it would have been a long, convoluted title with academic words and unnecessarily long scientific jargon. So I love this title, I do. But um, I also have to be honest and share with you that when the title came through to me in the, the provisional program on the weekend, I did have a little bit of a um, sort of cringe moment uh, because a, as a social scientist, when I was trained as a research psychologist, I was a trained um, psychology researcher to never use the word prove. So when, and, and the, the scientists in the room will be with me on this. When I saw the word prove, I had a little bit of a moment of like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble, I'm not supposed to use this word. Um, what I was trained to do, and, I, and, and honestly, in 22 years of being a psychology researcher, I have never once used the word prove. I was trained to say, we can predict, we can point to, we can have confidence in, we can suggest, we can show, but to never use the word prove. But in that moment of the little sort of, oh no, I've done something wrong, um, an expression that we use a lot in Australia popped up into my head. And it's an expression that we inherited from our um, British heritage. It's an expression that I know is also used in North America. And I imagine it, it's, an, it's an expression that you either directly know or you have your own similar expression. And so the expression that popped up into my head was, the proof is in the pudding. Do you know that expression? The proof is in the pudding. So the proof is in the pudding is that I can cook a delicious dessert, I can cook a delicious pudding, and I can tell you that it's a delicious pudding, or I can actually allow you to taste the pudding, and you can decide for yourself. 
So I'm not going to use the word prove today, but what I am going to do is to show you evidence after evidence after evidence of where schools have put in place wellbeing programs that have successfully built the mental health of a young person. And I'll let you decide the proof in the pudding. And we know that this is something that we need because the most recent World Health Organization statistics show us that young people across the globe are struggling. Somewhere between 10 to 20% of young people globally are experiencing mental disorder. And we also know that that's a, an underreported figure. Half of all mental illness begins at the age of 14. That's such a young age. And I, I have a 14-year-old son at home. And suicide is the leading, second most leading cause of death globally for young people. The second most leading cause of death. And it's preventable. And I don't know about you, but when I see these statistics, they make me feel deeply sad. And I don't just stand up on stage in front of you as a, as a research professor. Um, I also stand up in stage, on stage in front of you as a woman who experienced mental disorder in my teen years. And um, much like our last speaker, um, I grew up in a, in a difficult family, mother who had a very severe mental illness. Uh, she spent time in and out of psychiatric institutions, multiple suicide attempts, electric shock therapy, and when things weren't going so well for her, a lot of violence in uh, my childhood. So I am one of those statistics, and I suffered a mental disorder as a teenager. Um, my younger sister also suffered a mental disorder as a teenager. And when you grow up with trauma, it bonds you in a very special way. So my sister and I were very bonded, and we both made a decision at a young age to make meaning of our suffering, to grow up and help people, help children, prevent, prevent what occurred to us. So I grew up to be a psychologist, and she grew up to be a social worker. Um, but very sadly, I lost my sister to suicide. So uh, I want to say that I, I definitely engage with these statistics in my professional role. But these statistics are also very personal to me because I, I'm a person who's lived on the inside of these statistics. And for me, what that's done is forge a very clear sense of meaning and purpose. And I believe that the reason that I'm here, not just here in Dubai, but here, is to do everything I can to help to protect, build, and support the mental health of young people. And so with that clear purpose, one of the questions that's been guiding me for over a decade now is, what role can schools play in the mental health solution for young people? Because when you think about it, aside from family, schools are the place where a young person spends the most of their time. And if we step back and take the bigger picture of our society, schools are the institution in which most people spend the bulk of their time. Schools have access to a wide, the vast number of young people for long periods of time, from the age of four to the age of 18, five days a week. And that's not only in advanced countries, 99% of young people go to school in developed countries, but we're seeing really pleasing trends in developing countries as well. In the 1960s, only 50% of teenagers went to school in developing countries. Now, it's 80% of teenagers. And the figure is even higher for younger children, primary, primary and elementary school age, 90% of children go to school in developing countries. So across the world, schools are these institutions that have wide reach to vast numbers of young people for a long period of time, which says to me that they can be part of providing a mental health solution for our young people. But it's not just that we, schools have access, wide range of access to young people, it's also that when we go to school, this is the time where we have the highest level of neuroplasticity. And the neuropsychologists now tell us that there are two key peak periods of neuroplasticity. One is naught to six, and we've known about that for a long time. But the neuropsychologists, together with the adolescent psychologists, have also been able to show us in the last decade that we have a second key peak period of neuroplasticity. And that's between the age of 12 and 26. So obviously, neuroplasticity has huge implications for academic learning at school. 
but it also has huge implications for the mental health of a young person at school. And in fact, the neuropsychologists are now helping us to understand why it is that teenage years are the time where we are most likely to experience mental disorder. And that's because of this heightened neuroplasticity. In the teenage years, this is where a brain is the most vulnerable and the most susceptible to stress and negative influences, tipping us over into mental disorder. And that's a very confronting reality for a lot of teachers in school. I do a lot of work outside of the university and work in schools with teachers, training teachers all across the world. And that is a very confronting reality. But the neuroscientists also remind us that neuroplasticity cuts both ways. Meaning that at the same time that a young person's brain is the most vulnerable and the most susceptible to illness as a result of negative conditions, it's also the most receptive and the most open to flourishing environments, to changing our neurochemistry in a positive way and to setting up a brain that is mentally healthy. So schools are key conditions for creating mental health in a young person. And this is why more and more schools are adopting what I talk about in my writing as the notion of a dual purpose institution meaning that they have the purpose to be an academic institution, to build the academic learning of a young person. But equally as importantly, they have the purpose of also being a well-being enhancing institution. And we now know we've got two decades of research to show that we can teach the skills for well-being. The same mental processes that are used to learn math and history and geography are the same mental processes that a young person uses to learn well-being skills. They're the same mental processes that we use to learn real-time resilience, to learn cognitive reframing, to learn mindful acceptance, to learn character strength spotting and pro-social skills. So we can teach the skills of well-being. And more and more schools are recognising this. We're seeing this coming to global dialogue, like today. We're seeing uh, you know, the, the, the most influential international agencies talk about this idea of schools being well-being enhancing institutions. We're hearing it from the United Nations, we're hearing it from UNICEF, from the World Health Organization, the Organization for Economic and Cooperative Development, did a large study last year of over 37 countries across the globe and found that 70% of those countries have now built well-being explicitly into their national curriculum frameworks. So we're seeing from the various highest levels this, this understanding, this acceptance that we can teach well-being in schools. We're seeing a proliferation of research and a proliferation of practice and programs. Now, I know we're all excited uh, a little bit later on to hear from Goldie Horn about her Mind Up program. I mean, I was so excited when I heard that she was in my session, um, but also way more excited when I heard that she was speaking after me <laughs> and not before me, because that was a little bit of a daunting, how do you follow a famous Hollywood actress? So, with the growth of this field, one of the things that I've said about doing is trying to map the field because it is proliferating. We've got hundreds of research studies, we've got hundreds of programs. And in this mapping exercise, I was able to identify 10 key movements that are now being used to build well-being in schools. And to map those on a two by two dimension from movements that have more of a singular focus like mindful attention to movements that have a multiple focus. So looking at a range of different dimensions. Movements that have more of an intra-personal focus so teaching young person how to identify and manage their own internal landscape, and movements that have the interpersonal focus, movements that are looking at how we build social skills. And when we map these 10 broad movements, we see that there are a lot of different ways in which we can build the well-being of a young person. In my own journey, I was very lucky. I went to um, high school in the 1980s. In fact, this is the 30, my 30th year out of high school. In four weeks' time, I'm going back to my 30-year high school reunion, um, which is going to be an interesting event. But I was very lucky when I was in senior school that um, I had a humanities teacher who was also a meditation teacher. And um, back then, she was known as a kind of hippie. Nowadays, she would be known as a thought leader or a trailblazer in schools. But she, she I think she had a... Even though I didn't talk to anyone about what was happening at home, I think she had a bit of a sense with myself, and she set up a weekly meditation at lunchtime. So she invited me along, and every week she would gently remind me and gently nudge me, you're coming along to the meditation session, and I say, yes, miss. And she doesn't know this, but 
Those skills that I learned in those weekly meditation sessions were so transformative for me because I took those skills home. And in times where things were not going so well at home, I had a practice. I could go into, a, you know, kind of find a place in myself that was calm and secure and strong and still, regardless of what was happening on the outside. Well, like I said, it's been 30 years. She was an exceptional humanities teacher, but I cannot remember a single thing that she taught me in humanities. But still to this day, I practice the meditation techniques that she taught me once a week. And I have taught those techniques to my children. So teaching well-being can be so transformative. Now, I'm a sample size of one. I appreciate that. But what I did do after I had a look at mapping the well-being was to then go in and have a look at the evidence around some of these broad well-being movements. And I was able to find over 300 peer-reviewed studies that have tested, evaluated the empirical effect of teaching well-being skills to young people. Don't worry, I'm not going to go all th through all 300 studies, but I'm just going to pull out three meta-analysis and review papers. To, this is that kind of proof in the pudding bit, just to show you of the accumulating evidence that's occurring. Well, this is a um, large-scale study done within the movement of social and emotional learning. And of all of those 10 movements, this has been the movement that has had the most traction has been around for the longest and has had the most empirical research into it. This is a large-scale meta-analysis. You can see here over 270,000 students were involved, over 213 studies. And what the research has found is that when students were taught a social and emotional learning curriculum, they had higher levels of mental health. You can see a range of different mental health indicators here. Turning to another area within the, those 10 movements, resilience education. In resilience education, this is, a, this is a study done with over 16 trials of the Penn Resiliency Program done in the UK. Um, Jane Gillan, the third author, has also done a similar study in the US, again with 16 different studies. And you can see here that when students are taught the skills for resilience, they have better mental health. They have, it's a protective factor. Reductions in anxiety, reductions in depression, reductions in hopelessness. The third review is a review done on positive education and strengths education. Um, this is done with studies in the US, Canada, UK, Europe and Australia. Um, and with over 3,400 students, you can see here again that when students go through these curriculum programs, when they're explicitly taught how to better take care of their own well-being, compared to before the program and compared to a control group, multiple indicators of higher levels of well-being. So the proof is in the pudding. There is, as I said, over 300 scientific studies to now show us that we can teach well-being, and when we do, it improves the mental health of a young person. Science is important, but I think hearing from the students themselves is also important. So I want to close up my talk by um, sharing with you some of the, the students who've been through uh, my own wellbeing program at schools, the Visible Wellbeing Program. And let's have a listen and see what the students themselves are telling us. Being involved with the Visible Wellbeing Summit really educated me to understand more in depth why we're feeling the way we're feeling, what causes it, and what we can do to fix it. And on top of that, know that the teachers are aware of that as well. They have strategies in place to help you deal with that, and it helped me understand myself as a person a lot better than I did before. Being involved in Invisible Wellbeing has changed my thinking as a student, as in, we know that we have strengths that are stronger than others, but we know that the ones that don't rank as high, we know that they're not weaknesses, they're just strengths that we can work on. Since the Visible Wellbeing Summit, the teachers have implemented wellbeing in the classroom and spoken a lot about wellbeing and how important it is for us in grade 12. Our wellbeing is just so important for students. It's everything. Without your health and without your mental, physical and emotional health, you can't function properly and the more maximised you can make your wellbeing, the better. One of my friends, um, he was new, his name's Noah. Um, and um, he came up to me and asked me, um, will, um, would I be able, to play, be able to play with you? And I said, sure. And I told him the games that we played and um, I told him all the other people that were playing and then he just joined in and 
that was bravery. Yeah, because you can learn new things for asking people for to play another game, or like if um, your teacher says like. Um, you can all, there will be five minutes on the timer and then she'll put, only put two minutes and then we can say you said five minutes. And we also have something called mindful meditation. It's when we all lie down and there's like a clip playing and it's got music and, and then we all lie down and close our eyes and we just and if something after break time, because if something bad happens because you like had an argument, you can just let that go and stay in the moment and then you, you're ready to learn and be happy and calm. So, the, so I, I'm not going to use the word proof, but I do think the proof is in the pudding. And we've got a very strong scientific case for being able to promote the mental health of young people at school. And that little girl is seven years old. And her level of literacy and understanding around mental health as a result of being introduced to these ideas is quite profound. And I encourage us all to think about how we can bring that into the life of a young person. Um, and, and for me, in my own personal journey, I, I can't help but wonder if, um, if my sister had had the opportunity to go to a school that had taught some of these skills, whether she would still be with us today. So thank you very much.